there, folks, and welcome to the program. My name is John Feeks. I'm the lead pastor of New Life Sanctuary Church in Winnipeg. And in uh, today's video, I want to continue exploring this uh, very, very uh, important and touchy and emotionally charged uh, social issue called abortion. Now, I've already done one video on the topic, and um, in that video, we focused on uh, the nature of the uh, tiny developing entity inside the expectant mother. And I think that if we let the science speak to this, we come to the conclusion that the, uh, that entity is a human being. It's an innocent, developing human being. It's nothing less than human. And uh, if you haven't seen that video, I encourage you to, to have a look at that. But uh, both videos, uh, that one and, and the one we're doing right now, they, they do stand on their own. But I encourage you to take a look at that one. I want to start our program today by referencing uh, the words of Jesus in Matthew 18. He says in verse 3, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives a little one, a little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. You know, I think it's very obvious from this and other related verse passages that little children occupy a special place in Jesus's heart. And uh, abortion is not only harming a little one, it's destroying a little one. It's ending their, life, uh, their lives prematurely and taking them from the earth. And I don't think that the Lord would be very pleased with that practice. And I do believe that at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, Paul talks about this in several passages, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for example, uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, there is going to be a review of our faithfulness. And I'm not sure which social issues are going to come up there and which ones are going to be forgotten, but I have a strong suspicion that the issue of abortion is going to come up. And as Christians are passing before review, they're going to be interrogated by the Lord. They're going to be questioned, what did you do or not do to protect innocent human life? The, the, life, the lives of those who were most vulnerable among us, namely the unborn. So I do what I can uh, to draw some awareness to the topic, these programs I've decided to launch out in, and, um, and I try to be friends to the various pro-life uh, ministries that are active in our community. But uh, today we want to talk about uh, some of the most common arguments for abortion and why I believe they, they just don't work. Not if, you, if you're thinking, if you're logical, rational. I don't think these arguments go through at all. Now remember, uh, my first uh, argument, I'll give it to you right now in, in uh, deductive, syllogistic fashion. Uh, this argument would go something like this. Women do not have a right to intentionally destroy innocent human life. That seems to be a very commonsensical premise. I think most of us could agree to that. Premise two, abortion is the direct and intentional destruction of innocent human life. Therefore, women do not have a right to undergo an abortion. Now, in Canada, uh, the so-called right to an abortion uh, is being uh, promoted and applauded, and our liberal government, of course, defends and endorses this and, um, and, and does promote this. And um, when I dialogued with my liberal MP a couple of years ago, I asked him uh, about the nature of human rights in the first place. What are human rights, after all? Where do they come from? Uh, is it the case that the government is creating human rights? Or is the government recognizing human rights and trying to defend them? Well, of course, this man uh, knew nothing. I mean, you couldn't ask him the simplest questions that have to do with uh, social political philosophy, uh, government of politics, or ethics, or anything like that. I mean, he was just a complete degenerate, really, as far as I'm concerned. He just really couldn't put two thoughts together. And, and I asked him on the way out of his office, 
how in the world did you even get elected? How did you get into this office? Uh, you can't answer my simplest questions. And, uh, and long story short, he had no idea where human rights come from. He had no idea about the nature of human rights and what the government's role uh, really uh, was when it came to human rights, except that he was going to defend a woman's right, so-called, uh, to an abortion. And um, I, th I just think that we can do a lot better than to just chant uh, mantras or catchphrases. We want to speak intelligently to this important issue. This issue has to do with uh, the destruction of innocent human life. And um, if we're, again, if we're going to let the science speak to this, we have to accept that the developing entity inside the expectant mother is a fully human life, innocent human life. And if we're going to be not only rational, but we're going to be in some way moral, morally responsible, an ethically upright society, we can't honestly say that uh, in some cases it's all right to intentionally destroy innocent human life. It just doesn't seem uh, right to talk like that. Unless you're, of course, and some people that I dialogue with, they are morally handicapped. They think it's okay to destroy babies even after they're born. They think that maybe the, the mom should uh, have maybe like 30 days or something to decide if she wants the baby. And I've talked to people who, who um, they think like this and I don't know how far you're going to get in a rational uh, discussion with people like that. I think that uh, what's really needful there is uh, a conversion. Uh, God has to change the heart there on that person. I don't know that you, you can get anywhere with uh, just rationally dialoguing with someone like that. But I'm hoping that we have rational people right now tuning into this program and we can speak intelligently and responsibly to the topic. Now, if you're going to say that... Um, uh, the, that the developing entity inside the expectant mother is a human, if that's what we're going to agree on, and you also agree that abortion's okay in some instances, well, then you're going to have to say that there are certain circumstances in which the destruction of innocent human life um, is permitted and even commendable. Maybe even it's, it may even be the morally upright thing to do. What we want to discuss now are um, some of the uh, circumstances in which that would be uh, the case. It would be okay, and given these set of circumstances, it would be okay to destroy innocent human life. And we'll go for half an hour. We won't go beyond that. And if we can't get through the most common arguments for abortion, well, then we'll just pick it up in the next program, okay? Well, one common argument is, uh, well, the baby inside the mother is not as, uh, it's not as big as, as she is. It's not as big as a fully grown human being, or it's not as big even as a toddler. So size becomes the issue. Well, can you, can you honestly maintain that? I mean, if you're going to say because the baby is small, therefore you have a right to destroy that innocent human life, don't you see that um, such a pronouncement is arbitrary? And therefore, I mean, I could offer a contrary position just as arbitrary and it would have equal validity. That's not how we argue. You're not allowed to be arbitrary in rational dialogue, interchange, rational combat situations. Do not do not permit arbitrariness. Um, are we going to say now, really, honestly, that the size of an individual is somehow going to determine that person's worth or value or right to life? I mean, uh, if there's one thing that we do see when we go out into the world, you go to any crowded place, uh, and you just take a look at the staggering variety of people that you see there in terms of size, can we honestly say that size determines value or right to life? That doesn't seem uh, at all to be morally responsible. It doesn't seem to be ethically upright at all. Um, what about the level of development? You know, the, the, the baby, obviously that baby inside the mother's womb is not as developed as a, as a toddler or as an adolescent or as an adult or something. I mean, a person's life is one of both stasis and change. It's, it's uh, a relationship between sameness and development. That is the strange, mysterious uh, truth to human life. There is a relationship between things that stay the same and things that change. Your identity remains the same. You are who you are. I mean, even David Boonin's written things like that. Uh, you are you, despite whatever physical changes may be taking place. 
How, how you account for that will be something else. I believe it's because God is the objective identifier of all things in the created order. It's his created order. And he can identify certain uh, changing physical states and he can assign to this uh, a particular identity. And uh, despite whatever changes are taking place, identity is retained. And that would be the case with a human being. You are who you are despite whatever physical changes may be taking place in, in your physical body. And uh, we can go much deeper into that, and I think we have in earlier programs, but the point is a human's physical existence on planet Earth is one of constant change and development. And in fact, after you reach a certain stage, it's one of regression, actually. You start to degenerate, you start to get weaker, you may actually decrease in your physical stature, uh, you don't heal as quick, you become more prone to disease, you may start to, to develop things like arthritis, mobility starts to become compromised, and so on. And uh, so human life is just a, it's just, um, a spectrum of constantly physically changing states. And are we really going to look at a toddler and say that toddler's life is not as valuable as an adolescent? Or the adolescent's life is not as valuable as an adult's life. I mean, these th again, we're again we're getting arbitrary, aren't we? We're getting very arbitrary. Uh, in fact, I think neuroscientists would agree that um, a person's brain doesn't stop developing physically. Uh, well, actually, really ever. The brain is constantly changing and reconfiguring itself, and certain neural firing patterns are widening, and other ones are constricting, and so on. But in terms of a physical human brain developing to full maturity, that doesn't stop until somewhere in a person's early 20s. So are we going to say that because a person's brain has not fully developed when the person, let's say, is at age 15, uh, or is it the case that that person has less a right to life than a person at age 25 or age 45? Again, not only is this arbitrary, it's ludicrous. So again, what, what I'm trying to show you here is that uh, any excuse you come up with to justify the destroying of an innocent human life in the womb, you could apply that same logic to anybody walking around out uh, in the public, uh, anyone that you interact with in day-to-day -day life, anyone who's now on, on the outside of the womb, you could apply the same logic to justify killing them. And, um, and that's just applying logic here, okay? So size and the level of development, obviously these things cannot really be uh, appealed to uh, profitably, responsibly to justify the destroying of innocent human life inside the womb. Well, what about environment? Uh, is it the case just because the child is in the womb and not outside the womb, therefore that child inside the womb can be destroyed? And again, it doesn't seem to be at all obvious that environment would determine uh, the value of a human life or uh, the right to life that that individual would have or not have. Would it be environment that would determine this? I mean, I don't gain uh, a special right to life because I say cross the street or I go over across the border, I say I go to the United States for a visit. Is it the case that because I changed my geographical location, I no longer have a right to life, or my life is somehow less valuable? Or what if I roll over in bed? Is, do I lose value or gain value or a special right to life? It seems uh, really ridiculous, doesn't it, that, a, that a, a, a human being, and we know that these are human beings inside the mother's wombs, that that human being can travel a few inches down the birth canal, exit the mother's body, and suddenly now, it has the right to live. You know, guys like Peter Singer, a uh, secular ethicist, uh, he says this is quite arbitrary to think like this. And he, among others, uh, would argue that um, since we're going to be arbitrary here, why don't we just extend the, the woman's right to an abortion past the, the time when the, when the baby comes into the world, uh, i.e. exits the mother's body? Maybe she should be given maybe 30 days or a couple months to determine if she wants to execute that baby. Uh, again, uh, it doesn't seem ethically, morally responsible. It seems arbitrary. And on the face of it, it seems even ridiculous to assume that location alone 
uh, is a determining factor as to whether or not a, a person has a right to life. Um, you remember uh, in my last YouTube video on abortion, I shared a little uh, story there on uh, babies who were being operated on. They were receiving uh, life-saving surgery while still inside their mother's wombs. These doctors would go into the womb. They would sort of pull the baby out. They would perform surgery on these babies and then place them back into their mother's wombs to develop normally and then uh, be birthed into the world. Uh, if we're going to say that location is that which determines a child's value or right to life, are we going to say that these children were valuable and, and their lives should be protected while the doctors were operating on them because they're outside the womb? And then suddenly when they were put back in the womb, all of a sudden there their lives were meaningless, worthless, and could be destroyed at the mother's discretion. Is that, I mean, are we actually going to say that? Uh, if that's your position, I'd like you to think twice about that. Just meditate on that. Does that make a whole lot of sense that location would uh, determine the value of a human life or that person's right to life? Or maybe we could appeal to dependency, a level of dependency. Well, it is true, obviously, that the little baby developing in the mother's womb is dependent completely on the mother. That's true, but should it be the case that that dependency would determine the child's uh, value again and right to life? We have people today in the world who are dependent on things like insulin. Uh, my, my son has uh, type 1 diabetes and he's completely insulin dependent. If he didn't have insulin every day, uh, his life would be cut short. Uh, do you really expect me to believe that because he's dependent on something external to himself, uh, therefore, his life isn't valuable, or he or he could be executed uh, at my discretion. Is that that makes no sense? That's that's ridiculous, and um, I think you'd have to be morally handicapped to, to hold to a position like that. There are some people who have to go for dialysis. There are people on the iron lung, obviously dependent uh, on things external to themselves to to stay alive. We can't honestly believe that these people's lives were less valuable or they could be executed. Do um, you remember the uh, great physicist Stephen Hawking? Uh, Stephen Hawking was confined to a wheelchair and he couldn't even uh, speak. Uh, he had to have a machine speak for him, completely dependent, really, on, a, on many things external to himself. And yet, I, I don't think many of our secular ethicists today would say that... Um, because of this, uh, Stephen Hawking could have been destroyed at the whim of another person. Uh, sometimes uh, pro-choicers, those who are uh, for a woman's, and I'll put rights in quotations, a woman's right to destroy her unborn offspring, uh, they'll point to viability. They will say things like, um, uh, well, the child's not viable in the womb. When the child reaches viability, then... Uh, then you, you shouldn't maybe destroy that child. But as long as the child could not survive outside the womb on its own, then uh, until that point, the mother should be at liberty to destroy that child if she wants to. Well, this book here, uh, a Canadian publication, Pregnancy Day by Day, uh, it says here that at 24 weeks in Canada, a child is considered to be uh, viable. So at 24 weeks into the pregnancy, this publication, again, written by an army of healthcare professionals, experts in the field, they say that um, the child reaches viability here in this country. Now, I just want to point out that viability, dear friends, is not a, really a measure of value. It's just a measure of technology. Because in Canada, 24 weeks is where you hit viability, where, where if the child is born at that time, we could keep the child alive. We have the technology in Canada. But in Bangladesh, uh, viability is somewhere around 38 weeks. I mean, the, the child's almost full term. So let's think about this. In Canada, 24 weeks. In Bangladesh, 38 weeks. Are we honestly going to say that that child's life uh, loses or gains value depending on where the mother travels? That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. That child loses the right to live at let's say 30 weeks when the mother travels outside of Canada and goes to some third world country or something. The child suddenly loses the, the right to live and uh, mom then could be 
permitted to make the choice to destroy that baby. Again, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Uh, not to me. It seems, again, uh, very arbitrary. Well, one uh, situation in which a lot of people think that uh, abortion ought to be permitted is in the case of rape. What if the woman is uh, assaulted, she's raped, and a child is conceived uh, in, in the rape? Look, um, the fact of the matter is, rape is a serious issue. I don't know any pro-life person who thinks that uh, rape, rape is something to be scoffed at or that the woman hasn't undergone serious, serious trauma or that uh, the whole community shouldn't just rally around her. I mean, we need to do everything we can possibly do to support and encourage and to comfort a poor woman who's been assaulted and who's conceived the child in rape. Uh, there's no way we're going to take this lightly. I mean, I agree that uh, if the rapist is uh, caught and convicted, uh, he ought to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And oh, Ben Shapiro, uh, he suggests even castration or even the death penalty. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure about, you don't want to go too far because uh, what will happen is um, the rapist won't just rape the woman, he'll probably uh, kill her too if he knows he's going to get the death penalty if she, if she uh, presses charges and he's convicted. So, But I do think it ought to be a, a real serious uh, punishment for rapists, you know, maybe castration or something, but he ought to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. But again, just because uh, the woman's been uh, victimized, that doesn't give us license to victimize another innocent human being, namely the child in the womb. Now, according to the Guttmacher Institute, which is the uh, research arm of Planned Parenthood, the abortion mill, less than 1% of abortions are due to a, a woman uh, conceiving in rape. And if I could just, I want to explore this a little bit here because a lot of the people who are pro-abortion, they are uh, secularist in their general outlook, even atheistic, and uh, they will rally behind men like Richard Dawkins. Now, Richard Dawkins, of course, uh, he says it's immoral not to uh, abort a child you knew had a physical or uh, mental disability ability like Down syndrome. He, he went on record saying a woman is obligated to execute her unborn Down's baby. And uh, that's pretty strange for him to talk about uh, things in this way because he's, you know, it's, it sounds like he's appealing to ethical absolutes, but if there's one thing he can't be doing, it's appealing to ethical absolutes as an atheist. There would be no ethical absolutes. And in fact, uh, this is a quote from Richard Dawkins. Uh, he said, and I'm quoting him, we are human beings, that is, we are machines for propagating DNA, and the propagation of DNA is a self-sustaining process. It is every living object's sole reason for living. Now, this is what the atheist so-called thinker has to say on the issue. Uh, he says, our sole reason for living is to propagate our DNA. Well, hello, uh, when you talk like that, you've just made rapists everywhere very happy. You know, uh, if you come at this from a Christian perspective, rape is a serious crime, and under the Mosaic law, the rapist would be executed. All right? Uh, you're to love your neighbor as yourself, that doesn't mean you go rape your neighbor and victimize her, okay? And uh, again, you ought to be punished to the fullest extent um, if you're a convicted rapist. Again, uh, rape is a serious crime. We ought to punish the guilty. And uh, that, again, you, you don't go victimize somebody innocent because you yourself were victimized, you know? Uh, some people, they argue, well, you know, that child, if the child comes into the world, that child may remind the mother of, of her rape, of, of that horrible crime against her. Well, you know, she can always give the child up for adoption. That's, that's an option. If she chooses to keep the child, well, the child may remind her of that horrible thing that happened. But first of all, let's not forget that the child is an individual. The child is not the criminal here. And second of all, just think... Uh, uh, pull this into a situation where the child's already born and functioning, maybe five years old. And all of a sudden, the 
horrible memories of that assault come flooding back into that mother's mind. Is she, when the child's five years old, at liberty to destroy that child because that child reminds her of that horrible crime? Or can I go shoot my neighbor because maybe my neighbor reminds me of something that happened to me long ago? Again, you see, these things just don't, they don't work, do they? They, they just don't, uh, they don't uh, um, appeal really to our moral sensitivities. I think that's what I'd like to say. It's not logical and it doesn't really map on to our moral intuitions on these things if we think deeply about it, if we explore this in something deeper than just a cursory fashion. Uh, some argue that, well, maybe an abortion ought to be permitted if uh, the mother's life is at risk. And of course, that's a common, uh, it's a very common argument. Now, let's just remind ourselves that there's a real difference here between a woman going for an abortion to be performed on her in which the intention is to go in and deliberately destroy that unborn baby. There's a difference between that and a woman undergoing a life-saving surgery to, to save her life. And the uh, unintended, but the, you know, but the, the foreseen consequences are, it, it is the, the uh, loss of the baby's life. There's a real difference between those two things. In one case, you're going in deliberately to kill that baby. In another case, you're going in to perform a surgery that'll save the mother. And again, it's the unintended result that the baby is going to lose its life. But that's not why you're going in there in the first place, just to go and destroy a human life. I hope, I hope I'm saying that clear. Uh, this is Thomas Murphy Goodwin, and uh, the assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Southern California's Women's Hospital. And this is what he had to say. Uh, he said, our obstetric service in the Los Angeles area has been the largest in the United States for the most uh, of the last 15 years, averaging 15,000 to 16,000 births per year. Our institution serves a catchment for all high-risk deliveries in the area with 30,000 deliveries per year, excluding cases that have been diagnosed late in pregnancy. We do not see more than one or two cases per year that pose this degree of risk of maternal mortality. These are exceedingly rare conditions. This rarity does not diminish the tragic dimension of such cases, but the cases are seen in perspective when their numbers are compared to the total number of abortions performed. Uh, gynecologist Ron Paul was an obstetrician for 30 years, and he said he never saw a medically necessary abortion, not in his entire career. Uh, now this uh, public uh, health service here in Dublin, they have a declaration on the issue, and this is what they say in their declaration. As experienced practitioners and researchers in obstetrics and gynecology, we affirm that direct abortion, the purposeful destruction of the unborn child, is not medically necessary to save the life of a woman. We uphold that there is a fundamental difference between abortion and necessary medical treatments that are carried out to save the life of the mother, even if such treatment results in the loss of life of her unborn child. We confirm that the prohibition of abortion does not affect in any way the availability of optimal care to pregnant women. So as of June 2019, uh, 244 gynecologists and obstetricians, 200, uh, rather 526 healthcare professionals, 89 midwives and nurses, 57 neonatologists and pediatricians, and 21 medical students signed that document. It is extremely rare that a, that a woman would have to undergo a surgery that would destroy the life of the unborn baby. Very rare, less than 1%. And um, if you think that um, it is medically necessary, well, then we can talk about that. We can talk about those very rare cases in which, and we'll put it in quotations, an abortion would be necessary to save the woman's life. But what about the rest of the cases? What about cases where abortion is just being used as a birth control? Would you agree that maybe we should illegalize or at least at least defund abortion in those cases? And you know, it's a sad fact, but a lot of times people will turn to uh, 
these rare cases to defend abortion on demand. And when you say to them, okay, let's talk about those marginal cases. And what if I agreed with you? Would you agree with me then that the rest of the 99% of the time, abortion should not be used as a birth control method? And most times people will say, no, it should be abortion on demand. That's what should be permitted at all stages of the child's development in the womb. And I want to say that's absolutely dishonest to talk like that. If you want to defend abortion on demand, uh, then don't go to the marginal cases and try to use them like a tool to sort of uh, push through the door all these other cases where abortion is being turned to uh, just uh, to preserve a person's uh, convenience uh, just as a method of birth control. I think that that's dishonest, okay? And we want to conduct ourselves in a more honest and intelligent fashion when we're dialoguing about these really, really important and emotionally charged social issues. Okay. All right. That's uh, 31 minutes. I better stop right there. Listen, friends, I'm going to pick it up right there in the next program. We're going to look at some more common arguments for abortion and uh, we'll contemplate them together. And I think I can show you that uh, they're not really good arguments anyways. All right. You take care. Until next time, God bless you. See you soon.